Hey, this is Warren Redlick. I just watched this interview with Jack Stilgo. He is a professor in London, and he's supposedly an expert on self-driving cars. I'm going to go through this with you, and we're going to see, for an expert, he doesn't seem to know a lot. He has some really strong prejudices, so let's expose this nonsense, and maybe someday we'll get him to come on and do an interview, and we can have a genuine conversation, but right now, I just want to show what I see that he's getting wrong, what I think he misses. Are you ready? Let's go. I teach and research things to do with science and technology policy, and I'm particularly interested in how governments can deal with fast-moving new technologies, getting mo more of the good stuff from them and less of the bad stuff uh, from them. Um, and at the moment, I'm particularly fixated on self-driving cars. Right off the bat, I want to notice the premise that he's operating under, that we need government to protect us from scary new technologies, that somehow having these geniuses who run our governments, whether it's Boris Johnson or if you're in the UK, Trudeau in Canada, everyone knows how brilliant Trump and Biden are. If we need these genius people, and of course, with help from geniuses like Jack Stilgo, to help shape policy to make sure to protect us from those dangerous Elon Musks of the world. Maybe government is not the best solution to this problem, and that's going to come up again and again in this conversation. So what, what is responsible innovation then? It, how does that work? So responsible innovation is about asking scientists, engineers, innovators, tech companies to take greater responsibility for the futures that they help uh, bring about. Because in the past, there have been all sorts of incentives for those groups to not think very hard about about the future, right? To to do the new thing, to develop the shiny new uh, uh, gadget, and to let society realise the effects of those things in hindsight. And sometimes that hindsight is quite grim hindsight, right? So to try to improve the foresight of innovators so that we can have a broader discussion about, you know, where technology is taking us, how to get more of the good stuff, how to understand, anticipate and mitigate some of the risks, some of the downsides and hopefully come up with some uh, some better policies. But it means not just letting engineers, you know, not just leaving them to their own devices. So on that point about engineers needing government to protect society from the dangers of engineers gone wild and the grim future that could come as a result of this technological innovation without government making sure everything's okay. I will just point out that the most dangerous technological innovation ever was driven by government and the grimmest results resulted from government pushing for nuclear weapons, right? That's the big one. And that was government driving it. So somehow the notion that putting government in charge of making sure Elon Musk doesn't go too far with his self-driving cars is a little bit silly. There's no reason to trust government to use its judgment any better than Elon and Jeff Bezos and all these other engineers and entrepreneurs will do on their own. And really what he ignores, and you'll see this again and again in what he says, there's a complete ignorance of the market that people decide. It's not that the engineer decides on some new technology and poof, it dominates the world. It's that people decide, I want this. Markets have an influence. And what he's saying is he doesn't want us, the people, to choose what technologies we want to use. He wants to control us to decide what technologies we will be allowed to use. It's easy to push it off on those engineers and say those engineers are the problem, when really what's going on is they claim it's about democracy, but the people are the problem. The fact that we want better technologies to make our lives better, these geniuses are going to protect us from our own foolishness. That's the hubris that may come with being a British professor, and that will come up later too. Could you give us a summary of like the, si the current situation with self-driving cars? What is it? If you were to look at what's happening with self-driving cars right now, you could look at it in, in some ways that would be almost entirely incompatible. Because at one level, if you live in Phoenix, Arizona, you can, on an app, call up a Waymo that doesn't have a driver in the front seat and you can get in and you're the only person in that car and that car will drive you to a destination 
and that so in a, in a sense that is a self-driving car and it's all and it's already with us and that is remarkable just real quick here i hate to rain on the waymo parade we don't really know to what extent the waymo cars drive themselves waymo says they drive themselves but waymo also acknowledges that there are humans who are watching from a distance like a remote location where humans are supervising the self-driving cars and we don't know how much they intervene that information is not public. Waymo's not hiding it. And the practical reality is Waymo's been doing this trial for a long time. If it worked so well, why hasn't it expanded yet? The answer is it probably isn't working that well and the humans have to intervene a lot. So it's, not, it's, it's far from clear that Waymo is the state of the art in full self-driving cars. Think about, well, what are the conditions under which that technology works in those circumstances? And does that mean that it would work in other circumstances? So, yes, you can get a driverless lift around a few blocks of Phoenix, Arizona. Um, but that doesn't mean that if you took a driverless car to Rome, right? <laughs> or a, or a, 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 <laughs> the thought of a driverless car in Rome is terrifying. I'm just terrifying. trying to imagine you know, places <laughs> with rather less predictable traffic. Right. Um, and the old donkey and, we, and things. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, I guess more diverse, complicated uh, road spaces, you know, then the, the technology becomes useless, becomes instantly useless. There's a couple things in here that really struck me. Number one, the British snobbery about Italians apparently having terrible driving or terrible problems or being incompetent or having donkeys. There's this upper class wit uh, attitude about Italy. But this notion that somehow self-driving cars wouldn't be able to handle such difficult situations, this is going to come up again and again in this conversation. There is this assumption that somehow self-driving cars won't be able to handle something that humans apparently can handle, or maybe humans can't handle. Really unclear there why self-driving cars wouldn't be able to handle this just as well as a human. And Professor Stilgo never really addresses and really probably doesn't have the technical chops to be able to explain why he thinks that self-driving cars would not be able to handle this. My short answer is, if humans can do it, then computers probably can do it and you have to come up with a pretty darn good reason to say why they can't and i get asked a lot you know when will we see self-driving cars and i say well the question really is where i sort of agree with him on this i think it is likely that certain places will adopt self-driving cars sooner than other places florida has already made self-driving cars and robo taxi networks legal China is probably likely to be an early adopter. California, pretty likely to be early adopters, although we'll see because the state is so crazy. Michigan, on the other hand, is likely to resist. Europe is likely to resist. Bureaucracies are entrenched, and in Michigan, special interests have big influence. But we'll see. But for Stilgo, they will be in some places, and they will never be in others, is the way he sounds. And I think he's completely wrong about that. Yeah, levels from zero to five, zero being no automation and five being a, fu a, a fully automated uh, vehicle that can drive in all circumstances, anywhere. Um, and I have argued that, that that level five, you know, the completely aut autonomous vehicle, if you like, is impossible, right? There is no, there is no possibility of an artificial intelligence being able to drive... Uh, anywhere at all times because all of the all of our mobility is shaped by our environment right it always depends on on a particular set of uh, of conditions so he's pretty clearly saying level five fully autonomous vehicles will never happen the history of technology is full of things that machines couldn't do better than humans particularly the history of modern technology that humans are just better at everything, that there's some magic power that we as humans have, and machines could never rise to our level. And this is complete nonsense. We are flawed. Machines are flawed. It is far from clear that machines are more flawed. We are flawed in different ways, but machines are getting better fast. And it seems like Stilgo does not get the radical rate of improvement that we're seeing in technology, which is comical because he's a professor 
talking about issues of technology. He's seen massive changes in his lifetime, just like we all have. And somehow he doesn't, it's almost like he thinks it's going to stop. If you're a Tesla customer and you can go to the Tesla website at the moment and you can pay extra money to buy the full self-driving package, um, which is misleading as it's currently uh, represented because that the technology that Tesla are currently offering is actually a level two uh, technology, which is um, in, a, in effect, it's a sort of upgraded version of traffic aware cruise control and some lane keeping. And it does some clever things like it's able to move you on and off the, the highway uh, and it recognizes some traffic lights. But so an important thing to note there is he's wrong about Tesla. First of all, Tesla's website is not misleading. It very clearly says that full self-driving, autopilot, etc., requires active driver supervision. So his claim that it's misleading, that it's sold as if it's level five driving, very clear right there on the website, easy to see, it requires supervision. And I just want to say I'm particularly annoyed about this. If you're going to claim to be an expert on a topic, you should be able to get basic facts correct. And this, he's very clearly getting basic facts wrong. Tesla is a leader or the leader, depending on your perspective, a leader or the leader in the full self-driving space, self-driving vehicle space, to not know what's on the website for Tesla for buying this option when you acknowledge that it's an option you can buy on the website and you specifically refer to the website and you don't know that the website says what it says, and you claim it says something else, this really cuts into your claim that you are an expert. And it really diminishes your reliability as a person to comment. And this goes back to this idea, do we want government controlling this when the people who claim they're competent to advise government show us that they're either wrong or liars? And I held back from swearing there. But would you trust it to drive you from one side of a city to another? Well, I wouldn't. Now, this is an important distinction as well. Lots of people are doing FSD beta testing and they're putting their videos on the internet. And Kazi drove from San Francisco to Los Angeles with, I think, one or two interventions. He drove from Los Angeles back to San Francisco with zero interventions. Kim Paquette is driving all over with her vehicle in full self-driving and she's supervising it, but it's doing pretty well. Is it perfect? No, but it's doing pretty well. And what's underlying this is the notion that human drivers are fine driving across a city. Well, some human drivers are good at it and some aren't. I have two teenagers in my house. Well, one of them's in college now, but I have two teenagers and I don't always feel comfortable with them driving across the city. I don't think they would feel comfortable driving across the city. So you have to recognize that we allow humans to drive in all kinds of situation. And we allow human drivers who aren't that good to drive. You have this perspective of, well, I'm a good driver. Every one of us, most of us adults, we all think we are good drivers. But we're not the bottom. We're not the bottom of what's allowed to drive. 16-year-old boys all over the United States are driving cars in our cities. And I'm not that comfortable with them either, but we let them drive. Which isn't to say that some people aren't doing that, right? YouTube is currently full of, of, um, of Tesla drivers experimenting with their autopilot systems in some ways that, frankly, are, are, are terrifying. This one little bit annoys me, and it's not just from this guy. There's all these people getting upset when someone does a stunt, when the kid gets in the backseat of the car while it's driving on the interstate highway. And it's terrifying, and oh, you know, it's reckless driving and all this stuff. I'm not saying it's good, and it might violate the terms of service of your full self-driving package with Tesla, but it's not terrifying. What's fantastic is that it's not terrifying. It's not terrifying because the car is that good. The self-driving software, the self-driving hardware is that good that this kid can get in the back seat. And I have yet to see an incident where one of these terrifying monsters who lets their self-driving car drive themselves and doesn't obey the Tesla rules and finds a way around the holding your hand on the steering wheel. I have yet to see an incident where there was a crash, where there was anyone hurt because they let the car drive itself. It's already that good that people violate the terms and no one has crashed yet. 
We, it would be all over the news if someone violated the terms and hooked the thing up to the steering wheel to make to fool the car into thinking they're in the in the driver's seat, they're paying attention, and then there was a crash and someone got hurt. It would be national news because anytime anything bad happens with a Tesla, it's national news, right? Something bad happens with a Ford, it's not national news, but something bad happens with a Tesla, it's national news. This is no big deal. We need to calm down about it. It is not terrifying. It's fantastic that this happens and it's not terrifying. Right, so part of the confusion there is that Tesla are selling a level two system um, and they're pretending that that system is a level four system. So let's be clear about this. It is absolutely not true that Tesla is advertising that it has a level four system. Level four says the car can operate without human input or oversight under select conditions. There is no condition under which you are allowed to let the vehicle operate itself without supervision under Tesla's rules, under what Tesla offers, under what Tesla advertises, there is always supposed to be active driver supervision. So, Professor Kilgo, either you are badly mistaken, which calls your expertise into question, or you are a bloody liar, which calls your credibility into question as well. Which one is it? Are you stupid? Are you badly incompetent or are you a bloody liar? Take your pick. Let us know if you see this. So, so let's talk a little bit about the data. Like what, what are the issues with where that data comes from and privacy? You know, how does all of that work? Let's start by, by just demolishing the myth that a, a self-driving car artificial intelligence is basically like a human being because some some people like to present that you know oh basically you know a human being has sensors on the front of their face not very sophisticated sensors and they use them to process not very much information and drive and driving isn't very hard so you know a computer should be able to do that um i think the first thing to say is that ais do not work like uh the human brain they require different sensors and just as getting an AI to play chess, you know, you don't teach it to play chess in the same way. What you do is an approach that's sometimes called brute force, where you just throw huge amounts of data at, um, at uh, well, the various AI systems that you'd have, say, within your, within your self-driving car, um, which means that if a self-driving car is going to work even in a Small, a very limited set of conditions. It needs extraordinary amounts of data to, to learn from. I just want to interrupt briefly in the middle of this long talk he's giving. He's saying a lot, almost like he's saying so much he's not getting to a point. We know that comma.ai drives cars with just one camera with nowhere near the amount of data that Tesla uses, and it drives well in lane keeping in certain circumstances. It's not as good as Tesla, it's, but it's still not bad without anywhere near the volume of data that Tesla has and with only one sensor. So he's overstating the case for what AI needs. And of course he's correct that humans don't think the way AIs do. AI doesn't think or learn the way humans do. We don't really know how the human brain works or how the human brain learns. So that's not completely clear, but let's go on. Which means that, you know, the computing power required is, is, uh, is enormous. And you just need to think about the complexity of even a fairly boring, you know, daily trip in a car. You know, the exposure to all the possible uh, stimuli is, is, is huge. Um, so there's the data to train the um, the systems that are able that are able to drive, which means that a self-driving car is is peppered with sensors all over the place. Um, it is constantly comparing its vision of the world with the vision that is it is expecting, right? So it probably contains uh, a a three D map of the world uh, as well, um, and you could say, well, that's just to get it. That's just for it to, you know, for it to do its job. It needs all of those things. Again, he's sort of all over the place with this. It's not really clear what he's referring to. He says it requires an enormous amount of computing power. Well, Amadet AI does it with an Android phone, which doesn't strike me as a whole lot of computing power. Teslas have these two FSD chips in them, the FSD3 chip, which have tremendous amount of computing power, but it's just two chips and they're really just redundant chips. So just one of the chips is basically doing it. 
Is that an enormous amount of computing power? When he says an enormous amount of computing power, what does he mean? And he's not being clear, probably because he doesn't know either. What is this enormous amount of computing power that's needed? How much computing power, one of the things that's, that's missing in pretty much everything he says in this entire conversation, you can check out the whole video, is there's no acknowledgement that the human brain, how much processing power do we have? How much of our processing power is devoted to the driving task? Not necessarily as simple as you'd might think when you try to compare to these computer chips and what they're doing, hard to make that comparison. And it's not obvious that our processing power is better when you cabinet it into what we use for driving and what sensors we have. So hardly as simple as he seems to think it is. And he just sort of minimizes the potential of self-driving cars without any kind of sophisticated analysis. But as you say, there are, there are some really profound questions there to do with who has access to that data. Is it just contained within the car? Is it transmitted to uh, a fleet of cars so that they can all learn from each other? If you follow Tesla closely and you watched Autonomy Day, you know the answer to this question as far as it goes towards Tesla. Tesla vehicles compile a huge amount of data and they hold on to it. When Tesla's home office is working on updating the software, learning from situations, they query the fleet. They look to see whether the fleet has relevant data. They see some odd object and they're not sure what it is. They query the fleet to see if anything in the fleet has had similar objects that it has viewed so that it can learn by seeing multiple images. They don't upload every bit of data that the cars generate because 100 miles driving on an empty highway, staying in the same lane does not generate useful data for learning. The idea that Tesla or self-driving vehicle fleets are uploading every bit of data to the network or they're sending every bit of data to all the cars, that would be a massive amount of bandwidth. It would be a massive data storage problem for every car. That's not what's happening. And when the system learns how to drive better, how to drive better is transmitted in a changing of the weights in how machine learning works. It's not sending all the cars, here's what happened with car X in such and such a location. That's not the data that's being transmitted. They're transmitting essentially programming. Here's the new weights for how to operate, which has no data from another car. It's just learning. What might the cybersecurity risks of that be if a self-driving car sees a murder happening on a road? Do the police then legitimately say, you know, in effect, you've got a, a surveillance network driving around on your road. So can we have access to that to that data? So just the availability of all of this sensing capacity has some has some profound questions. You have to be a university professor to think that Tesla's having a network of cameras that can help catch a murderer is a profound problem. This is not a profound problem. This is a great advantage of having a network of cars with cameras. It helps reduce crime. Number one, it helps catch criminals, which I don't know many people who think we want criminals, murderers to get away. I think most of us think we want people who commit crimes to be held accountable for their crimes. But there's a deterrent effect. If people know that there are cameras everywhere, if they see a Tesla and they realize that thing has eight cameras on it, and then they decide not to commit crimes because of it, well, that would seem like a good thing. And we know that there have been Teslas in sentry mode that have caught people engaging in vandalism and other behavior that's dangerous to the Tesla, damaging cars, whatever. This is almost unequivocally a good thing. There may be something bad about having a surveillance network out there and the gov if the government was surveilling us and watching us, but they're already doing... He's a professor in London. London is filled with government cameras watching everywhere. And all of a sudden he thinks it's a problem if Tesla has a network of cameras that are learning from the roads and in sentry mode to protect the car in case somebody vandalizes it. And this is an ethical problem. There's also a really important question of, you know, when one of these things gets into a crash, do the people that regulate and try to improve the safety overall of the system have access to that data, which is the case when an airplane has a crash, right? We don't just say, oh yeah, Boeing can be trusted to have that data. Boeing has to give that data to the regulators so that everybody can learn from it. So the question of who learns what from data and who's allowed access to it 
um, is a really important one. At the moment, it's not really being asked. I don't know the laws in England, but I have a pretty good grasp of the laws of the United States. And if a Tesla's in an accident and the government wants to get the data from the car, we have this thing called a subpoena, which I'm pretty sure the British have too. And by subpoena, the government gets access to the data. There's no question here. This is just silly. And if Tesla's involved, if a Tesla vehicle's involved in an accident and somebody sues Tesla, then they get access to the data through a discovery process. This is not complicated. This is not challenging. As far as we know, I haven't seen any complaints from any regulatory agency that Tesla is hiding data. I haven't seen stories of people suing Tesla and complaining that Tesla's hiding data. Governments hide data all the time. As a, I'm a DUI lawyer, if you don't know this, and they use these machines to test your breath. And the government agencies do everything they can to prevent defense lawyers from getting access to the computer code used by the machines that test people's breath. That their data is, they try to hide their data from us all the time. That's not something I actively do or I've actively been involved in, but I go to seminars for DUI lawyers and state governments and local governments and manufacturers of these breath test machines do everything they can to keep people from knowing how their machines work. With no good reason, because if the machines aren't working properly, we should know that. And if they are working properly, where's the problem? So this, you know, again, this is a manufactured concern. There is no real problem here. And you have to be a university professor, maybe in London or maybe anywhere, to come up with this as a problem. It feels as though you don't have a choice about any of this stuff. If you buy a particular type of car, some stuff will happen, but you can't choose, you can't pay extra and choose an option where they don't have your data, right? The, at the moment, there's very little choice in all of this. Like, how should we have choice or should this all happen further back? Like, how do, how do we, it feels like there's some big questions where the consumer can't do anything at the moment. What, what do we do about that? Buy a different car. How about that? The consumer doesn't have any options. There's a ton of car companies out there. There's all kinds of different car companies with all kinds of different cars. You can buy a used car that doesn't have the advanced technology if you want. You can ride a bicycle. You can use public transport. I'm sure no one's going to be watching you on public transport. There's no government cameras in London watching where people are going. You're completely safe. Again, just making stuff up. Where is the problem here? Yeah. Do we all just have to buy into this or not buy into it as a society? So it might be, I mean, there might be a further issue that comes from, you know, self-driving cars. There's a, a, a real question of whether it makes sense at all for consumers to have any choice over the type of self-driving car that they might in the future have access to. If you consider how complicated a self-driving car will have to be in order to do the job of getting from from A to B. It might have to have an extra £100,000 worth of sensors stuck to its top, and those sensors will need to be maintained, right? And people can't be trusted to maintain those sensors so that they work. So, Okay, so for number one, no, Teslas do not have £100,000, a large currency value of equipment on top of the car that's lidar systems used by other car companies tesla doesn't have it comma.ai doesn't have it so it's not required and number two the disdain that he has for us ordinary humans that we can't be trusted to maintain our cars that choice must be taken away from us because we cannot be trusted is total nonsense we already have this is an existing problem right our cars are, some states require inspections, others don't. I'm, I'm from New York State uh, originally, and when I had a car in New York, you had to get the car inspected every two or four years. Now I live in Florida, there's no requirement to get the car inspected. And I'm not noticing any particular problems in Florida with the fact that we don't have required inspections. Some people take care of their cars, and some don't. This is not like rocket science, and self-driving cars don't make this problem worse. We already have this problem, if it's a problem, and I'm not sure it is a problem, but let's take something that exists in, this is a very common thing I see with self-driving cars, with Tesla, boring tunnels, Starship, whatever. People will make up a problem, like, well, robo-taxis won't work because people will make a mess in the car. Well, that's already an issue with Uber, it's an issue with taxis, it's an issue with mass transit. Why are you manufacturing that there's some problem that's already there that's somehow going to be worse with self-driving cars when it might actually be better with self-driving cars. Same thing here. People might not maintain their self-driving cars. 
well, maybe the self-driving car will maintain itself and refuse to drive unless it's well-maintained. That's something a self-driving car can do that a regular car can't do. Why not look on the bright side? Always look on the bright side of life. Do-do, 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 do-do. Monty Python. That's Eric Idle. So one of the one of the really interesting social sociological implications of a self-driving future might be how it reconfigures the re- the role of the consumer in in all of this. Are we are we people that are that are still sort of buying into an automotive dream where companies are competing on speed, power, comfort, you know, safety, whether or not, whether or not we allow companies to compete on safety at the moment, we don't allow aeroplane manufacturers to compete on safety. Um, but yeah, I think it's, it, 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 it could be one of those really big existential issues. If you are a current car maker thinking, what does, what does my future look like? What am I selling to people in 50 years time? It's almost like if you're a university professor, you can just talk and say stuff that adds up to nothing, adds no meaning, adds no value to our lives, and somehow use that as a basis for saying, gee, self-driving cars are scary because, what, because they'll be safer? I, I, did anyone follow what he just said? Because I sure didn't. What was the point of that? That was just blather. I'll do, okay, how safe is, so how safe is safe enough? Is a, so this is a classic question of social science. So... You know, engineers can't answer this this question because they don't get to decide what acceptable uh, risks people will take. This is one of those moments where professors still go, takes you out of the equation. You, the consumer, you, the driver, you, the person who wants to go for a ride in a safe vehicle. He says engineers don't get to decide how safe it needs to be, but he's also preventing us from deciding how safe we think it needs to be. And he asserts as if he has the right to decide how safe it should be or some governmental body composed of people who we might not think that much of and might not put that much thought into it and might be biased in a variety of ways we don't like, that somehow they're a better place to decide what's safe enough for us rather than letting us make those decisions for ourselves. And if you are an engineer, sometimes you will look at um, for example, the relative safety of an aeroplane and a car, and you'll say, well, isn't it a bit irrational that people are at, accept the risks of getting in a car, right? And, a car and, and driving and being on the roads is probably one of the most dangerous things that most of us do, um, right? More than a million people die every year in, in car crashes. It's a public health disaster. You'd almost think he recognises that human drivers are not particularly safe, and self-driving vehicles would make us safer and save lives. You would almost think that. But, you know, e- Elon Musk, for example, would say, oh, well, as long as you can improve on average levels of safety with self-driving cars, then we should just accept the technology, go for it, do it as quickly as possible. Really, Professor Stilgo, is that what Elon Musk would say? Hmm, it isn't enough to be safer than human drivers, says Elon Musk. Autopilot ultimately needs to be more than 10 times safer than human drivers. How did you miss that, Professor Stilgo? Your interview was conducted not long after Elon said this. He only said this a few weeks ago. Your interview was like a week ago. Why do you talk as if you know how Elon Musk thinks when you don't bother reading what he says? Why do you say things about Tesla misleading people about full self-driving when you apparently don't read the website that you claim misleads people? This is how you destroy your own credibility. Elon Musk does not say what you claim he says. The Tesla website does not say what you claim it says. If you are going to claim to be an expert on such things, do your bloody homework. But I'm thinking, if you know, if you reduce that million deaths a year to half a million deaths a year, is that going to be enough to, to persuade the mother of the child who's just been killed by a robot what we know about how people think about risks is that it matters it matters whether or not they are seen as in control of those risks it matters whether a human is in control rather than a robot is in control it matters who is who is to blame is it a faceless corporation or is it an individual what are what are the rights of redress in the in the courts right yes you heard that right Professor Stilgo is willing to sacrifice 500,000 lives a year 
for this nonsense ethics stuff. It makes absolutely no sense. If you could save 500,000 lives a year by switching to self-driving cars, you would. I would. Any normal human would. But if you are a British professor who claims to be an expert and gets to go and talk to people in these sophisticated situations and perhaps puff a cigar or a pipe and talk as if you're educated and thoughtful, you can think it's okay to kill half a million people a year because of this bloody nonsense. And he doesn't even see how dumb that sounds. And the woman he's, who's interviewing him doesn't say, well, wait a minute, half a million lives a year? No reaction, no, no, no outrage. This is an outrage. If you could save half a million lives a year and you won't because you're worried about somebody might be offended, come on. So the question, how safe is safe enough for a self-driving car, is still really open. I just think we don't know, but my suspicion is that people are going to want them to be you know, as safe as planes or trains, not just a bit safer than the current disaster that is, uh, that is road safety. So I want to be clear here. I'm not speaking for Elon. I disagree with Elon. I don't think self-driving cars need to be 10 times safer than human drivers. I think self-driving cars only need to be safer than the worst drivers that we currently allow driving on the road, especially if we design the system so that the self-driving cars replace the worst drivers. So if you said self-driving cars end up being as good, as safe as the average driver, and you take the bottom 25% drivers, the worst drivers off the road and make them, or somehow it ends up being that they choose to ride in a self-driving car, because generally speaking, the people who are the worst drivers also have the highest cost per mile. It costs them more to drive because their insurance rates are higher. They probably have bad credit, so their financing costs more. So for a lot of reasons, they tend to pay more to drive. They would have more incentive to switch to a self-driving car, which would cost them less money than somebody who's a very safe driver with good credit, who has low insurance rates and low financing costs. Even if they're just as good as the average driver, self-driving cars can save lives if they get those worst drivers off the road. The 16-year-olds, like I have teenage kids who drive. If I could put them in a self-driving car that was as safe as the average driver, that would be better than my kids driving. That would be better than their friends driving. I would rather have them ride in a I would rather have them ride in a self-driving car that's as safe as the average human driver than have them drive themselves. Teenagers in general are worse drivers than average. Drunk drivers who get to drive continue driving, they get people with a history of drunk driving, people with other kinds of bad traffic histories. We still allow them to drive generally. If we can get them off the road and into average safety self-driving cars, that's a win that saves lives. Any solution that leads to more death is a bad solution. Any solution that leads to less death is a good solution. And unless you're puffing a pipe at University College of London, you see that. I hope you see that. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe you guys think, ah, you know, it's got to be 10 times as safe. And sure, if it takes 10 years to get there, and it costs 5 million lives over that 10 years, eh, that's a cost of doing business. You know, no, we want to save more lives. Say you're on a train. You're on a train, and for some reason, five people are tied to the track in front of your train. As normal uh, on a Tuesday afternoon. You know, and, yeah. and <laughs> down there, there, there's another track with one person uh, uh, tied on it, uh, on, on it. And you have to decide do you switch the tracks to run over that one person or do you let the train carry on and kill those five people so it's a bit of a it's a bit of a a, a, a false a false problem but it does raise an, an important question which is that robots making decisions that have value considerations and that have differential outcomes Right, in which some people might be harmed, some people might benefit, some people might uh, might be harmed. That is a profound question for society to have to deal with. So to give the professor credit here, at first at least he acknowledges the so-called trolley problem is kind of a nonsense problem. It's not a real world problem. But his suggestion that robots are going to be making ethical decisions is incorrect. That's not how self-driving cars learn to drive. They emulate how human drivers drive. They are trained by the best human drivers. They watch 
Tesla specifically identifies who are the best human drivers and work to make sure that the self-driving software is learning from the best human drivers. It's really simply a matter of, if you listen to Jim Keller's interview with Lex Friedman, it's just a matter of identifying objects and ballistic probabilities. Where is this object likely to go? Where is that object likely to go? And what do the best drivers do when they're faced with this set of objects and probabilities? That's how they make decisions. They're emulating the best human drivers. And at some point, they will be better than the best human drivers because they can see behind themselves, because they never get tired. They never fall asleep at the wheel. They don't take, they don't drink and drive. They don't get distracted by the girl in the bikini. Sorry, no bikini girls in this video. So this is where we're heading. And they also make decisions faster. They, they're able to process more data more quickly and make decisions in faster time than humans can make decisions. That's why they're going to be safer. So two years ago, when an Uber self-driving car killed a woman, Elaine Hertzberg, Right. The real ethical dilemma there was something that engineers were programming to. And that was the question of how you balance false positives against false negatives. So self-driving cars will never be able to know the world perfectly. They won't be omniscient in the same way as human beings aren't. Right. We guess at what's ahead based on previous experience and all the rest of it. And when Uber's engineers were um, deciding how to tune their system, Right. They were deciding, should we worry about shadows on the road and paper bags and other things that actually drivers would just ignore? Um, and they tuned their system so that as it was, it failed to account for a woman pushing a bicycle across a road where, yes, she shouldn't have been. Right. Because jaywalking in, in America is illegal. Um, but still, it, it showed you that there was a real ethical dilemma there in terms of how the engineers were trying to understand the uncertainty. And I think that tells us more about the risks and opportunities of a self-driving car. But one thing you'll notice is, yes, it is true that a, quote, self-driving Uber was involved in an accident where a woman died. It wasn't two years ago. It was March 2018. It's nearly three years ago. The woman wasn't just jaywalking. She was walking across a street in a bad spot where it was dark at night wearing dark clothing with a bicycle that she had removed the reflectors from. She did everything she could to make sure that people wouldn't see her when she was crossing the street. And then she crossed the street at a spot you're not supposed to cross the street. And the Uber, Uber had a guy in the car who was supposed to monitor the car, watch the road and make sure it was doing what it was doing. And he wasn't doing what he was supposed to be doing. So this was actually a human caused problem, not a self-driving car caused problem. And what he's describing, the engineers making choices about how to program the vehicle for false positives, that's not how machine learning works. Tesla is not making those judgments. He's looking at three-year-old technology from somebody who was doing it the wrong way. Tesla is doing it a different way, emulating the best drivers, going on what they see comparing what it sees to what they see and how they act in those circumstances. The technology is radically different now than it was then. We have FSD3 chips now that we didn't have in 2018. There's so much going on here that he just brushes aside. And okay, there was one death there. It's not even clear that a human driver would have avoided the accident. Human drivers are involved in a lot of accidents where people die. And they're often at fault. The human driver is often at fault. This is a case where, at best, the Uber vehicle was somewhat responsible for the accident, but it was primarily the pedestrian's fault because she crossed where she shouldn't have crossed and she did everything. I'm not saying she intentionally did everything she could to cause the accident, but she went, what I would say is, out of her way to avoid being seen. I think if you're going to be walking at night, you should be visible so that you don't get hit by a car because the driver sees you. You do everything you can intentionally or not to make yourself not seen, then you've created a big risk that you're going to get hit by a car. The important point is he's completely ignoring how Tesla self-driving technology works. I don't know exactly what Mobileye is doing. I don't know exactly what Waymo is doing. But to assume that whatever Uber was doing is the way is very, very dubious. And by the way, I believe Uber had LiDAR 
And supposedly LiDAR is the thing that's going to make it all work, and the LiDAR didn't work. So for those who think LiDAR is the answer and Tesla should use LiDAR, this is an example. They had LiDAR and it didn't save the day. Yes, clearly engineers were making really consequential decisions there, but they were making those decisions responding to a set of incentives that came from a Silicon Valley tech firm saying, we're in a race. We need to develop this technology faster than anybody else. We need to win. We need to show that we can do this. Incentives to cover up what you're doing. Um, incentives to test in public without telling the people that live in that area that you're testing in their, in their community. There's a lot to unpack here that he's got wrong. First of all, they had the governor's approval to operate this in this area. So to say that they didn't inform the public, they got approval from the government to do it. This is a guy who wants the government involved in making these decisions and the government was involved in making the decisions. What exactly do you want? And was there haste? Well, sure, you would want to get this working as quickly as possible because once it works, you're gonna save lives. He's attributing bad motives to Uber when Uber was trying to do something good. I'm not saying they were perfect. I'm not saying I agree with everything they did, but they were trying to do something good. They were trying to get self-driving cars, which would make people safer. His bashing of Silicon Valley tech firms is very, it's an easy target. Oh, those big bad tech firms. Yeah, those big bad tech firms are making our lives better. And yes, when people invent new technology, sometimes things will go wrong. It's far from clear that they did something wrong here. The very clear thing is that the human guy who was in the car who was supposed to supervise didn't do his job. But that's a human problem. That's not a technology problem. The human in the car didn't do what he was supposed to do. They put a human in the car, which is presumably what you want. You want humans to make sure we're safe. And then the human didn't do what he was supposed to do. So what solution do you have for this? Well, if you had a, if you had this guy driving the car without self-driving, who's to say he wouldn't have blown it anyway? One of the tragedies of innovation is that often, you know, it takes a catastrophe to get people to change their approach. It takes a catastrophe. Now, look, I'm not saying it's a good thing that the woman died, but one woman died. You can't make everything a catastrophe. You're demeaning the word. This is one of those things that I get really angry about is we get in these discussions about how things should work and we destroy the meaning of words. One person dying in a car accident is not a catastrophe. It's terrible for that person who dies. It's terrible for the family. Frankly, it's terrible for the guy who was riding in the Uber who's supposed to be watching because it's been terrible for him. It's not great for Uber. It's not a great thing, but it's not a catastrophe. A cruise ship sinking and 5,000 people dying is a catastrophe. One person dying in a car accident is bad, but it's not a societal catastrophe. Let's make sure we maintain that words have meaning that makes sense. Someone died, it's bad. Let's not get out of control here. Yes, I know if I was in her family, oh, it would be different. No, if I was in her family and I knew somebody was trying to come up with a safer car, and it so happened that this time it didn't work, I'd be unhappy about it. Maybe I'd sue, and they did sue. But over the long haul, I want people to make the road safer for everyone. If you don't want that, okay. But I think that's what we want. I think we can all agree we want the roads to be safer. And having people trying ways of coming up with technology that will make us all safer is better than not trying. And that's where Stillgo is going to take us, that we don't try at all. He has no solution for how we go forward to create a world where automation makes us safer. Nothing. He's got nothing. 100%, whatever happens in the future, 100% self-driving cars is not anywhere on the horizon in the next few decades for a few reasons. One of them being that people like driving cars and all the trust issues that you mentioned. So I would just like to say that I'm thankful that these two people are not making decisions for the future of the United States of America. 100%. There will be self-driving cars in America, in Florida, in the next few years. And, you know, even earlier in this conversation, he acknowledged that there were self-driving cars already, Waymo in Phoenix. I don't necessarily agree they're really self-driving cars. That's another conversation. But Florida law, 
says self-driving cars are already legal. Robo-taxi networks are already legal and they are protected from local government taxation and regulation. It's coming. It's coming fast. If you don't see it coming and you think it's decades off, I'm sorry that you've got your head stuck up so far that you can't see the sun. The light is coming. We are all going to be safer. No thanks to these two twits. I, I either want to be completely in control or completely not in control. And the idea of having to remember that this car is one that will change lanes for me, but it won't do an emergency stop, right? That, 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 there's that. And then there's the half and half. Like there's this in, enormously mixed world. How do we navigate all of that? Yeah, absolutely. What kind of nonsense is this? All kinds of cars have all kinds of different features. In many things in our lives, we deal with things with all kinds of different features. Somehow I manage with three remote controls for my TV. Is it frustrating? Yeah, but I figure it out. The cars aren't that complicated. If you're driving the car, you're driving the car. If it's a self-driving car and it's a full self-driving car, it drives itself. What problems are you manufacturing that don't really exist? This is crazy talk. This is the kind of nonsense, and we need, instead of having this quote, quote expert telling people to be afraid, be very afraid, maybe he should be reassuring and say, you know, self-driving cars are coming, and they're going to be great, and we're not even going to need a steering wheel soon, and the car will just take you where you want to go, and it is going to cost less, and you're going to be safer. Wouldn't it be great if he said that? And, you know, be optimistic about the future? Where is this pessimism coming from? Where is this terror, terror fear, whatever, coming from? I don't know. But it's nonsense. So the, all the evidence is, is, is that humans are really bad at being what's called on the loop. Okay, it's okay if humans are in the loop, working with robots to achieve a sort of task. What humans are really bad at is being on the loop, where they're monitoring an automated system to do a job. And we know this from, from aeroplane autopilots, that highly trained pilots overseeing autopilots do it very badly, they become less skilled uh, with, with, with time and all the rest of it. Which means that if you're behind the wheel of a Tesla and you're turning on autopilot, that is a really dangerous situation. Um, and it requires a lot of additional skills that I think most drivers do not have. I'm afraid that's not exactly true. Lex Friedman at MIT and a group of researchers studied the behavioral impact of driver's roles in automated driving. And they found that the semi-automated driving setup that Tesla actually uses, where the driver is supposed to pay attention, resulted in strong user attention. They didn't overtrust it. The autopilot situation that Professor Stilgo is talking about is where you don't have to monitor it so they don't. Wait, the way Tesla has it set up, the driver is required to monitor the operation and pay attention. And there's basically no evidence that this is creating problems. Tesla's in autopilot and navigate on autopilot and self-driving mode are not experiencing a high rate of crashes. And thus his fear that this will somehow be terrifying and people won't pay attention, someone's going to die, is not turning out to be true. So the idea that all studies point this way is not true. This is a study from MIT that says the opposite. Well, there's those little pods near Heathrow Airport, aren't there? Where there's, right. a, there's little tracks and they've just got little pods on and they're all the same little pods and they all know where they're going and, it, yep. and it's fine. And if a dog or a, or, a, or a granny or a rabbit gets in their way, then that's probably their fault. Now, do you notice the problem here? When a woman crosses the street where she's not supposed to cross the street, wearing dark clothing, taking the reflectors off the bicycle, doing everything she can to avoid being seen, and gets hit by a car that can't see her because she's done everything to prevent herself from being seen and she's walking where she shouldn't walk, that's the self-driving car's fault because he doesn't like self-driving cars. But if Granny steps into a system that he likes, then it's Granny's fault. You see the, the, the twisted thinking. If I like this system and somebody gets hurt, it's the person's fault. If I don't like this system and something happens, it's the system's fault. This is twisted thinking. This is hypocrisy. This is the exact kind of dangerous thinking that this self-important, uh, highly educated, persuading yourself that you're smarter than everyone else attitude creates this mess. This is a guy who should not be listened to. It's scary to me that he is teaching people in classes. 
it's scary to me that people listen to this guy and help use his advice to make policy decisions because he's just frequently wrong. And his behavior, his credibility, et cetera, is not trustworthy. It's not reliable. He is not demonstrating the credibility, the thoughtfulness, the intelligence that we would want in someone making decisions about our safety. And he presumes that he's better placed to make decisions for our safety than we are to make decisions for ourselves. I completely agree that we're not going to have a 100% self-driving world in 50 years' time. I would go so far as to say we will never have a 100% self-driving world. All you need to do is look at the fact that we still have horses <laughs> on the streets of London, right? I saw no. some this morning, actually. <laughs> I went out for a run this morning and I genuinely saw some horses. This is the kind of nonsense thinking, well, we'll never have 100% self-driving because we still have horses. Yeah, 99.9% .9 of people get around in cars and 0.1% get around on horses. Close enough. Probably 99.99% .99 in cars and 0.1%, 0.01% on horses. This is, you know, what kind of nonsense argument is that? It's just totally silly. I think the interesting, where it's going to be, become politically uh, contentious is when, for example, a self-driving car company says, well, actually, our technology is much safer than the alternatives. But in order for it to work, we need you to get rid of your pedestrians on this type of road. We need to not have cyclists there or cyclists are in a separate lane. Um, and we just need the world to be tidied up to suit our sensors and to suit our AI. And maybe we also need the world to be made a bit more machine readable. For me, it's very frustrating to listen to this guy talk because it's as if he is absolutely doing everything he can to avoid seeing what Tesla is doing, how full self-driving works. Full self-driving from Tesla is designed to work in the same complex environment that he imagines a self-driving car company will say, listen, our stuff will make us all safer if you change everything. No, Tesla's full self-driving software is learning to operate in the same environment that humans operate and be safer than humans. It's not either or. It's not like Tesla's coming and asking governments to say, get the pedestrians off the road. It's saying your pedestrians will be safer on the road with our full self-driving than it is now with human drivers. And that's something that he can't seem, I don't, I would say he can't get his head around it, but he's not even trying. He's not making the effort for a guy who's an expert in the field or a self-proclaimed expert in the field to not know what full self-driving is for Tesla. How he's criticizing Tesla along the way to not know what they're doing, to not know what they're trying to achieve, to not understand anything, to apparently not watch FSD beta videos. Like, oh, I watch FSD beta videos all the time. Kim Paquette. Earl, so many others, uh, Omar, there's lots of people doing these videos. You can see what they're doing. They're not driving them in pedestrian free environments. They're spotting pedestrians that humans wouldn't have seen and avoiding them. It's magic. It's amazing. It's fantastic. And if you're this guy, you just ignore everything that might be good about self-driving cars and pretend it's all bad. And that's killing half a million people a year if you take his attitude. So we're going to need you to take or add to your traffic lights a thing that says, because it's stupid, a self-driving car looking to see if a traffic light is red or green, right? It's really stupid when the traffic light could just communicate its status directly to the self-driving car wirelessly. Tesla full self-driving recognizes the color of traffic lights. It doesn't need the traffic light to digitally communicate what color the light is. It already recognizes it. It turns out that computers are pretty good at distinguishing between red and yellow and green. This is not a difficult problem. They figured it out. It already works. Watch an FSD beta video for crying out loud. Uh, because some of that happened with the arrival of the car in American cities at the start of the 20th century. And so what American cities did in a lot of cases was ban jaywalking. Right? They said... In effect, streets are for cars. I didn't they... know that's where it comes. From. It came from. It's, it, it, it really bugs me in America that not only, you know, it's not just the jaywalking. I mean, they actually treat walking on a sidewalk, on the pavement, you know, as a, you just, must be something wrong with you. There's... What, where in America did this woman go? 
where you're not supposed to walk on a sidewalk. It, it's called a sidewalk. We walk on them. I don't know where she was. I mean, people don't tend to walk in LA very much, Los Angeles, but uh, we have a sidewalk in front of my house and we walk on it. I was just in New York City, one of the big cities that he seemed to be talking about, and they have sidewalks and lots of people walk on them. I have no idea what she's talking. This is the brainlessness that prevails, like utter, utterly blank-minded, empty thought process. Where did you come up with this? How do these people get to any position of any authority when they are so mindless? I have no idea. The, the self-driving cars and the electric vehicles, they're kind of coming along at the same time. And sometimes it's hard to t almost to tell the difference. Okay, so, so an electric car drives using electric motors and batteries and a self-driving car, whether it's using a gasoline engine or an electric motor, drives itself without a human steering it or pressing pedals. This is not confusing. This is only confusing if you're a moron. You know, if you are a city that wants to embrace not just novelty and modernity, but also some idea of clean growth, right, you might have swallowed a, a story that not only are self-driving cars safer, but also they're greener in, in some way. Um, I mean, if you look at the self-driving cars that are shuttling people around, uh, most of the, the, you know, in most cases... The developers of those self-driving cars, they don't really care what the, what the actual vehicle is, right? It just needs to be a vehicle that they can shove their software into. Um, in most cases, they are hybrid vehicles. And I think that's because you do need a massive battery to power your computers. Okay, so two layers of stupidity here. The first layer is most of the vehicles that have self-driving software are Teslas because there's a million of them. And there's very few of other cars that are actually self-driving cars. And all Teslas are electric. They're not hybrid. All Teslas are battery electric vehicles. Second layer of stupidity is that Tesla's cars do not need a massive battery to power the self-driving computer. The self-driving computer is very efficient in a Tesla. The equipment that allows self-driving in a Tesla is very energy efficient. It is true that if you put LIDARs all over your car, then it's going to use a lot more energy. It is true that if you use inefficient chips, it's going to use a lot more energy. But Tesla's system uses a lot less energy, and the purpose of the large battery pack is range. And the reason that they made their system so energy efficient, the, the reason they made the self-driving system so energy efficient, is because they didn't want it to take away range. So this guy has absolutely no clue he frequently uses tesla as his target for what's wrong and then his description of what's wrong is something that is not true with tesla tesla's cars are greener they are cleaner and they do not need a massive battery pack to power their highly energy efficient self-driving setup does it actually make it more likely that we're going to have a world in which the internal combustion engine car is still all over the place it just happens to be driven by a computer Right. And maybe instead we should be aiming for forms of sustainable shared transport that don't look like that don't look like cars. And there it is. The bias. He doesn't like cars. He likes mass transit. More sustainable shared transport. People want personalized transport. They don't want some British professor telling them they got to pack into his trains. People have been telling us that for years by the way they act, by the way they live. And the fact that you don't like our decisions does not solve problems. Tesla is solving these problems by making a sustainable transport with cars we actually want to ride in and drive in. And you don't get it and you don't care. And you didn't watch Autonomy Day and you didn't watch Battery Day. You're not watching FSD beta videos and you have no actual clue what Tesla is really doing. You just don't like it because you're biased and you want more mass transit that people don't want to ride in that costs a lot of money. We need to start with what 
mobility should look like in the future? What do we want our worlds to look like in the future? And then how does technology solve those worlds? which means that the technology companies are not going to come up with the answers, right? We need to have, that's a responsibility for governments, it's for civil society, it's for um, well, a, a, a massive range of people to imagine a desirable, a desirable world. This is this notion that the best and brightest in British government, American government, whatever, these geniuses who run everything and get us into wars and waste lots of money and destroy our economies and make everything miserable, that these are the geniuses who should decide how we should live, not us. We shouldn't decide how we want to live. And he blames it again. He blames it on the technology companies. We don't want the technology companies making the decisions. That's a lie. The technology companies serve the consumers. If we don't like what the technology companies are doing, it doesn't happen. The technology companies come up with technologies that consumers want. Elon wants to make products that people love. Elon wants to provide services that people love. Still go wants government to make decisions for us and control our lives and somehow decide this is the way things should be because they're smarter than we are. And I hate that myself. I think that's a terrible way looking at the world. I feel powerless in this, basically. I guess I, don't, I can't change what Tesla decides to do. I can't choose to buy a Tesla car, which is one system and not the other one. It's an option. You actually do have to choose that you do want it and you have to pay extra to have it. It's just mind-boggling that these two people are talking about Tesla and talking about self-driving cars as if they actually know what they're talking about when it's so plainly transparent that they do not know what they're talking about. You absolutely have lots of choices of cars you can buy that are not self-driving cars. It's actually hard to find cars that are self-driving. Maybe in the future that will be different, but right now, if you want self-driving, you have to pay a lot of money to get it. And if you don't want it, you just don't pay an extra $10,000 and you don't get it. And it comes with a basic autopilot and you don't have to turn it on. Just don't press the stock and you'll be able to keep driving the car. It's not that complicated. Well, that's enough of that. That took a lot longer than I thought. I think that this was, to me, disturbing that two people who are purportedly well-educated and one of whom is a self-proclaimed expert and recognized apparently by British academia know so little, have such horrible biases act as if they know more than they do and get so many things wrong. But uh, I actually did a series of videos where I interviewed candidates and elected officials and others about how self-driving cars would interact with the law in the United States. And you can check that out here. And of course, you can check out my other videos. Please subscribe. Please support this channel on Patreon. Check out the t-shirts. Links below. This is the uh, 2023 Tesla Compact. And thank you for watching.